Fantastic. Well, thank you to the support team who has got this online event up and running. And good evening and welcome to everybody who is watching. I'm very pleased to be bringing you this special live event. My name is Megan Williams and I'm the coordinator of the River Country Campaign at Friends of the Earth. Uh, and tonight we're having a conversation about the engineering projects that are planned for our Murray floodplains. Uh, and indeed floodplains throughout the basin, throughout the Southern Basin with Jamie Piddick, who is a scientist from the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. And he'll be giving us a background into how we've ended up with these projects as a solution to some of the environmental problems in the basin and whether or not they stack up environmentally. We also have Doug Nichols, a uh, Wadi Wadi traditional owner and cultural educator here to share some specific concerns about the, the projects on his country uh, in the Nye Vinifera Forest and to talk about the cultural heritage concerns about building projects on floodplains and what protections exist within the Aboriginal Heritage Act. Um, but before we begin, I would like to invite Jacinta Chaplin, if you're on the feed here, Jacinta, who is a Wadi Wadi woman who is on country to welcome us to the event. Um, so I'll just give you a second. If you're, if you're watching with your camera off, please switch your camera on, Jacinta. Mm -hmm. I think she might not be here. She was having trouble with her phone earlier today. Uh, so hopefully she will be joining us in a little bit. Um, and it will be great to get the on country welcome. Actually, if there are any Wadi Wadi people watching right now um, who are on country and would like to do the welcome, you'd be welcome to turn your camera on. Uh, and give us a, a welcome to country. Is there anyone from Wadi Wadi watching in the Zoom who is on country? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Um, but hopefully Jacinta will join us in a bit. Uh, I would also like to pay my respects to the elders of the lands on which I am. I'm joining us from Barkindji country uh, on the Barker, the Lower Darling River. Uh, it's one of the areas most heavily impacted by the poor implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And uh, the basin is home to 40 Indigenous nations. And I would like to pay my respects to the elders past and present from right across these great lands and also pay my respects to all the First Nations people who are joining us um, watching uh, and participating in the event tonight. Uh, rivers are life and culture and First Nations people hold the knowledge that is deeply connected to country and are so often on the front line feeling the impacts of water policy um, first and hardest. So um, wherever you're joining us from, you can pop in the comments, tell us where you are. You can acknowledge the country that you're standing on um, and tell us what you've come along to, to learn about today. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Doug, who's going to share with us some background about the Nye Vinifera Forest and the history fighting for country and what's going on out there. So Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, it's a uh, great, great privilege to be and honour to be on your show, or the Zoom show. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. That's fantastic. Look, um, I welcome everyone out there watching and um, hearing us tonight. And it's great to have the opportunity to uh, say a few words. Um, what it is, is that uh, our culture, Aboriginal culture throughout the Murray Darling Basin is, uh, has got a lot of knowledge out there. And this knowledge has to be uh, sourced out and understood properly to understand how the waters do run. As we know, there's uh, many, many Aboriginal sites throughout the Murray Darling Basin. In our little neck of the uh, woods there at Nye Forest, there's, there's the most earthen man sites ever recorded in the uh, Murray River floodplain area on the river, on the Murray River, in one, one river precinct. And that's quite valuable information. And, our sites have a very uh, recognised understanding of how we uh, lived and survived in the, on the river, as such as there. 
and the sites do tell us many, many stories. Our, our science is already out there. It's already been done. It's through our uh, creation stories, through our knowledge of our heritage. Our spirituality has to be recognised in a more positive manner to help with the science and help with the uh, greater community or the wider community in our area to um, understand how the waters do run. Now, let's look at it um, for many, many years. We have very, very old sites, thousands, thousands of years old. Uh, and we have stories about the Murray Cod, how it created the river. And that's how our rivers flow. If the river is not flowing, the cod don't flow. And that's very important. This is the survival area, as well as Wadi Wadi peoples. And to make connection true to the land and waters, we've really got to understand how important our spirituality is strongly. The Hooties Act is, uh, is very valuable to us, but we've got to really dearly understand the spirituality of a site. It's not just a site on one part of the bank and, and another area. We have a total connection, a very spiritual connection. We live in harmony with the land for thousands of years prior to European impacts on our uh, water systems. And we were, at the moment, what we're doing now is trying to fix things up. Why is this so? We need to work out a proper format. We're going to look at better ways to work with governance. And without a community group, such as Friends of the Forest at Nye and Vinifera there, it would be pretty hard for us as Indigenous community because uh, our heritage seems to be coming to last on the agenda. And really, our science is in our sites. Our science is in our spirituality. And let's face it, a lot of our people are buried in, in, within the... Uh, I've for forests in the uh, earthen mound sites. Let me tell you about earthen mound sites. They were made from clay balls from the river bay. They were fired up heat retainers and we cooked lots of food, lots of fish. We utilise all that water in a certain time of the year. Like our seasonal activity time is very important to us. Like uh, not long now, we'll surely, surely have cod spawning time. That's very important to understand that is the time. This is the time it happens. If the water ain't there, it's not doing its thing, we've got problems. Why is this so? So culturally, uh, we're very not we're not impressed the way the water management is going at the moment. Uh, we're, we're, we're dry, dry as a bone. And I've got to tell a story about a story about the Raji people who have a story about Kittalik. You know that story about Kittalik, the greedy frog. Now there's another frog on the scene at the moment. We don't know who it is. We need to know, find out what this frog is about, what a species it is, because something's sucking our rivers dry again today's day and age, unreal. So there's a story that is happening today about a legend story from a long time ago happening right now. Now, really our, um, our sites in the forest here, like I mentioned before, do tell a long story, an old story. And we've had the sites recorded for many, many, many times over and over again. We know what's out there. We know what's needed in the forest. We need cultural flow. Cultural flow is water that's got to be there. No, this is not environmental flow. I'm trying to explain is that it's not environmental flow. We'd like to have that also. But cultural flow is dedicated water that's got to be there at a particular time of the season for our Nazi or for our totems to uh, work within and survive into at the same time. You know, so we need to do that. And maybe some questions might come out of that down the track. Thank you, Megan. Mm. And, like, what are you seeing... Um... Like, can you give us some examples of what you're seeing on country at the moment? Like how the country is responding to the amount of water that you're getting as opposed to what is traditionally known in stories? Well, if you look at the Murray Cod, we know that uh, in the great time of Tuchigal and his family who chased the Murray Cod down the river, in that part of the river there, well, the river there is called Malu. And as you go down towards uh, the Wentworth Junction, the cod becomes pondy. So Narundri comes into the storylines then. And this is a festive, this is a time of the year where we've had plenty of fish around. Now the fish are moving. And if we don't see the rivers moving, the fish can't move, we've got problems with a story that's thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. That's enough science there to tell us that we've got issues. We need the water for them fish to move. Mm. And can you tell us a bit about um, how much work you've done over the years and your family has done over the generations in protecting the Nye Vinifera? Look, it, it goes back a long time before I was even born. We've had stories passed down and our knowledge is, very, is quite valuable. Uh, my knowledge comes from my elders, of course, and from their elders way back. And a lot of the experience on the Murray Rivers in my time, that's when a carp came in. 
You know, the carp was uh, so much of a nuisance species of fish, and they still are. And one person asked me one time in regards to science about, well, how did the Murray Cod create the river? Well, you know, you look at our storylines and how it works, it's that particular time of the star constellation uh, at the end of July, that's when the spawning season is in. So our cat is in the sky. So look up in the night sky in the uh, northwest, you'll see the dolphins, the dolphin. And the dolphin is our Murray Cod. So it's quite unique that another culture around the world has got a, a fish up there like we've got. And that, that fish represents, that's the time of the spawning time when the fish are moving. But in the forest itself, um, the knowledge I dedicate back to my spiritual ancestors who were buried there. I was inspector on the Heritage Act for 11 years. The knowledge I got was passed down about how important sites are, especially the mound sites. Yeah, my job was to preserve and protect Aboriginal cultural heritage throughout the Swanola Nye district. And we had cultural heritage office all around the state. There was 26 of us, 26 cultural heritage officers. And we worked closely with the Robin Vale and Majura and Bendigo communities to uh, care and protect our heritage. And as we went along and protected our heritage, we found lots of stories that relate to caring for country, our legends, how our country should be looked after, how we shouldn't do this and how we can do that. So there is a governance out there that relates to our culture. It's called the Three Missy Stick Governance. Our cultural governance, that's our law. It was put there a long time ago by our creators and it still exists now. We want to abide by those laws still. But it's very, very persistent that um, we keep talking to um, general public as well as state government agencies to let them know that we need to be a part of doing any works within any waterways along our river. We have to be there at the table. We cannot make up decisions or design things without us being there because our ancestors and their sites tell us that this is how the water systems work in their days. It's not working now. Mm. And that is perhaps a good segue to hear how it is working now. Um, so, Jamie, you're going to give us a background on that. But before we go to you, I might just put the call out one more time. If there's anybody inside the Zoom who is a Wadi Wadi person on country that would like to do a welcome. Um, turn your camera on now. And Jamie, you can start the screen share. Yeah, turn your mic on now and let us know if you're here. Um, otherwise, we're going to start the screen share. So thank you for that introduction, Doug. Um, uh, Doug Nichols is a Wadi Wadi traditional owner who has been sharing some stories. And Jamie Piddick, for people who have just joined us, is from the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. And he's going to talk through how, um, how it is that we've come to having these projects and what it means for uh, the Murray-Darling Basin and for the areas that have the projects and that don't have projects. Take it away. Thanks, Megan. Can I just check that everybody can see the uh, slide okay? Excellent. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. I'm speaking to you from uh, Nunawal country on the Upper Murrumbidgee, and I'd like to pay my respects to the uh, elders of the First Nations uh, of the rivers in the basin, uh, past, present and emerging. And thank Doug for that very eloquent uh, description about what it means to uh, care for country. What I want to do is talk to you about um, how it is that we've got this situation where the Victorian government is proposing to do uh, major, what they term, sort of Orwellian term, environmental works and measures on nine floodplain areas on the Victorian side of the Murray. So just to begin with, uh, before um, colonial occupation, uh, the rivers would uh, naturally flow in the way that uh, Doug talked about in ways that had high flows that promoted uh, fish movement. And those high flows uh, would support different kinds of wetland ecosystems at different elevations up the floodplain. And so lower down on the floodplain, a flood every three to five years supports red gum forests, for example, 
And then a rarer flood up here every five to 10 years supports black box forests. Of course, since occupation, many big dams have been built uh, to change the river flows like uh, Hume Weir near Albury. Uh, and a lot of water is being removed for irrigation farming. And so if there's too little water getting onto the floodplain, this is the worst sort of outcome we can see here at Psyche Bend near Mildura, uh, where the floodplain forests and wetlands have died, uh, where we've got extreme salinity. Uh, the soils have dried out and started to acidify. Uh, so that sulfuric acid you can see in that pond. And essentially the floodplain transitions to terrestrial vegetation. The dilemma that we have in our society today is that the irrigators have been taking out around half of the water that flows in the rivers. Uh, and when the governments got together during the millennium drought and got some scientists to advise them on what, was, what were the minimum environmental water requirements, in 2010, they said 3,000 billion litres. Now that became politically difficult for the governments and since then they've found a number of excuses to reduce the amount of water uh, to be taken back from irrigation farming and put back into the river and the floodplains to make it healthy. And so most recently last year, uh, the Senate uh, agreed to reduce the amount of water in the Barker, the Darling River system by 70 billion litres they also agreed to, and there's a warning here, uh, river management contains the most awful uh, white fella bureaucratic jargon uh, you'll ever come across. The so-called sustainable diversion limit adjustment projects, which is what we're talking about. So they came up with this idea that these engineering projects could enable uh, the same or more uh, flora and fauna to be conserved with less water and have reduced the amount of water to be reallocated by a further 22%. And so it's those projects that I'm going to uh, talk to you about now. And Jamie, I might just pause you. You've got, we can see your slides, but you haven't got it in present mode. Can you do that and then I'll go full screen for everyone. How's that? That's it. Excellent, Everyone's thanks, Megan. Righto, so the question is, if we are to take out some water for um, some farming and for our towns and cities, how do we keep the floodplain healthy? The best way is to let out uh, environmental and cultural water in pulses from dams like Hume. So it travels downriver, fills up the river channel and spills onto the floodplain to get up into the different wetland ecosystems. So the governments have studied how to do this. This map shows seven places in the rivers where they've said it's most important. Uh, that means flooding some low-lying paddocks next to rivers uh, that are currently owned by uh, 3,300 landholders. The governments agreed to compensate those landholders and have allocated the money. They agreed to do this in 2014 but the Victorian and New South Wales state governments have not implemented those promises. Uh, and so this restoration of the natural flow pulse of the rivers, the lifeblood of the rivers uh, has not been proceeding. No. Instead, uh, what they agreed to do uh, in 2018 was fund these 36 projects uh, across the Southern Basin. So each one of these green marks on the map is a project. Uh, and there's a range of different projects. Uh, so they're reducing the water uh, for the environment uh, by 605 billion litres. Uh, they've allocated $1.1 billion of federal money to build these projects. They're all supposed to be built uh, by the state governments, particularly by the New South Wales and Victorian governments, who are supposed to report on their completion by 2024. Now, there's a whole lot of slay of hand being adopted by the governments here. So, for example, not all these 36 projects are equal. 
some of these projects are actually good projects. So for example, uh, the um, Nari Nari Nation have received back a lot of their floodplain country uh, in the Gaini wetlands between Hay and Bal Ranald. And this money has paid for a lot of the old irrigation levee banks to be breached to allow the water back on country. But many of these projects are very, very damaging. And so what the government did was rather than enable the merits of each individual project to be assessed one by one, uh, they've made them one job lot. And so to see whether these projects will actually save water and conserve biodiversity, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has done one model across the whole basin, rather than testing to see whether the millions they're proposing to spend uh, on engineering works in, in Naya or Vinifera uh, actually make a significant difference or not. Uh, and so this is one way that they're avoiding uh, accountability. The governments have been very vague about what the purpose of these projects are. Uh, clearly, it's a part of a political deal to get the Victorian and New South Wales governments to sign up to the Basin Plan to agree to reallocate 2,750 billion litres to the environment, uh, but the state governments only agreed to sign if they could claw some of that back through these projects. So that's clearly one of the objectives. But different government officials have given different excuses for doing this. Uh, remember the national law that enables these projects to proceed is based on environmental treaties where um, the actions are supposed to conserve uh, examples of all the flora and fauna. And so one question is, do these projects conserve all the flora and fauna? Some government officials say this is about putting water onto core wetlands to keep them healthy in a drought. Other government officials privately are saying that because climate change is already reducing the amount of river inflows uh, and because irrigators will continue to take water, that these projects are about protecting a small number of jewels in the crown on the floodplain wetlands, that this will be triage. These will be the only areas to be conserved in a dry and degraded future. So let's now just quickly look at what the Victorian government's proposing. Um, they're saying that they are involved in 22 projects alone or in conjunction with uh, the New South Wales and South Australian governments. So nine of these projects are about changing the rules by which uh, they let water out of dams and manage the flows down the rivers. And some of those projects would be uh, beneficial for the health of the rivers. One of the projects is so-called constraints relaxation. This is what I talked about earlier, about reconnecting the river to the floodplain. And that would be a really good thing to do. Six of the projects are old projects known as the Living Murray projects that have already been built on the floodplain uh, in Victoria. And now the Victorian government is proposing nine new, what they call environmental works and measures projects, including Naya and Vinifera forest projects that we're talking about here. Now, a couple of the actions that they're proposing are good. So they are talking about, for example, taking out block, block banks in some of the uh, billabongs and the uh, Paleo River channels. So that would enable water to flow more naturally across the floodplain and that would be good. But most of what they're proposing to do, I don't think is well justified. And so they're talking about things like building pumping stations or canals to channel water out of the main stem of the River Murray and onto the floodplain, and then build a whole lot of levee banks or stop banks or regulators to pond the water uh, on the floodplain area to try and mimic a, uh, a natural flood with a higher river flow. 
So when I look at the Victorian, um, the nine Victorian projects, uh, my student uh, Isabel has done a bit of an analysis of the, um, the, the government documents. So the nine projects would cover around 62,000 hectares of uh, floodplain wetlands. <clears throat> But these engineering works would only enable 23% of that area to actually be inundated. And when I look at the, um, the basin watering plan targets, this is the, um, the overarching plan for the basin about what wetlands to keep healthy. In this section of the river, these projects would only water, help water uh, around 2% of the wetlands. And so it's a lot of money being spent that won't enable uh, a, a watering of a very large area. These projects are really, really, really expensive. So up to $30,000 per hectare of floodplain wetland that would receive water. So by comparison, the first um, tranche of projects, the Living Murray projects, that figure was around $700 a hectare. And importantly, um, the frequency with which the Victorian government is proposing to water this floodplain, uh, the floodplain areas like Nyer and Vinifera, uh, doesn't coincide with the watering targets in the actual basin plan. And so the Murray-Darling Basin Authority in uh, critiquing the Victorian projects uh, talked about, for example, the Victorian government proposing to flood these areas more frequently uh, than would occur under natural flows and flooding them in a way that's not consistent with the overarching basin plan. Uh, and so that's of some concern. So uh, instinctively, a lot of people, including a lot of Victorian government officials who I know feel that they're doing the right thing and helping the environment with these projects, um, think that the, it's good. You know, you've got a dry floodplain, red gums, black box need water. This will help get water on the floodplain, so it's good. But scientifically, I and many colleagues are really worried that there are some environmental impacts of these engineering works on the floodplain, in addition to the impact on the cultural sites that Doug spoke about. Uh, so well. So these projects uh, involve building things like levee banks and stop banks that will actually stop some flooding of floodplain wetlands uh, outside the sites. And uh, we've already seen examples of that being built in the previous projects in, in Hatakulka National Park, for example. The river ecology depends on um, overbank flows bringing back into the river channel organic matter, things like leaves that are the basis of the river food chain. If the water's being put onto the floodplain and kept there, then that's not bringing the organic matter back into the river. And there's a real risk too that, uh, for example, fish will be trapped on the floodplain. Uh, in some places, there are risks that the way this is operated will increase salinity and blackwater events and algal blooms if it's not managed very carefully. The other thing I worry about as a policy wonk is that once you build infrastructure on a floodplain, it's very expensive to maintain. Uh, so each of these projects uh, involve the Victorian government having to uh, allocate something like $100,000 a year, every year forever, to do things like maintain the levy banks and the regulators. Now, um, you know, what happens in the state government is jeffed. Um, you know, if there are budget cuts to the catchment management authorities and so on, who is going to actually operate this equipment? So the governments are planning to spend $1.1 billion on these projects. And the obvious question is, uh, could that money be spent in a better way on other things that are more environmentally, socially, and economically beneficial? And I would say the answer is yes. There, uh, that money, to my mind, would be better spent on 
Uh, here's the jargon again, constraint relaxation, um, reconnecting the floodplains to the river, buying more water to keep the rivers healthy, perhaps buying back some of the key wetlands um, for the traditional owners for uh, nature conservation. Uh, and we could also spend that money addressing other problems like uh, water being released from dams that's too cold to support native fish. So having spoken in general terms, let me talk specifically about uh, Naya and Vinifera. Um, these are really expensive projects. Uh, the cost per hectare is exorbitant. Uh, only a little more than half of the area of the floodplains uh, would actually be able to be inundated when these engineering works are, are built. Uh, and coming back to that question of, will it support all of the different plants and animals? Uh, the, uh, the inundation will uh, support more than half of the red gum forest areas of these floodplains, but very little of the black box forests. And so it's not a very good way of conserving all the different plants and animals. So let me finish by just summarising my problems with what the Victorian and federal governments are proposing with these nine uh, environmental works and measures projects. Uh, one is that they're not very clear about what the purpose is. The second is that they don't do a very good job of uh, conserving the different, all the different plants and animals. They're being used to justify uh, having less water in the river to keep it healthy. Uh, they, uh, these projects have environmental risks and costs that the governments haven't been uh, very good at acknowledging. They are really expensive projects. And the way the governments have um, prepared and approved the projects, it makes it very hard to judge each individual project to work out whether it's providing value for money or value for the environment. Um, and that's in addition to the important cultural values that Doug has spoken about. Megan, uh, let me leave it there. I'll stop sharing the screen and we can have a discussion. Yes, thank you very much for that, Jamie. Um, if you have joined us, we're talking to Jamie Piddick and Doug Nichols about uh, floodplain projects that are being built uh, around the Southern Basin, but also in particular in one very special area on the Naya and Vinifera forest. Um, and we are open to questions now. I've seen a few coming through on the in the comments section and I have made note of them. But yeah, if anything comes up for you and you'd like to ask a question, pop it in the comments and uh, I will we will try and get to it. Um, but so maybe to kick off the questions, Doug, when you hear about these plans and when you know like you kind of talked about the um the science of the many thousands of years of observations and stories um, of your people when you hear about the plans to engineer these environmental outcomes and see the kind of the uh, flaws that are apparent in the existing plan how does that sit with you and your cultural ob obligations in protecting country and um, for the ancestors? Well, it's quite, um, it's a situation that's uh, blown all out of proportions. There's no proper consultancy. The briefs are done through desktop studies with no understanding of how the spirituality of the land and water works. We generally, when we enter our sites into the, um, into, the, into the arena, and here's an Aboriginal site, on the Victorian Registrar and a lot of the organisations you get a hold of that through a, uh, a database and all of a sudden let's go ahead and really like there's not enough um, conjecture about understanding the value of the heritage issues within the floodplain areas if not the whole Murray Darwin Basin all the water needs to run at one time when it's flowing it needs to control all the way through it's got to flow. It's like I said before, with our dreaming stories, our creation stories have told us this and they've, that knowledge is passed down from thousands and thousands of years. It still exists today. We've got a problem now. It's, never, it's not going to be fixed by 
putting band-aid issues back within floodplain areas and creates um, stagnant water within the uh, parks and floodplains, it'll be a nuisance to us and it's creating more problems. In the old days or in, in present days, if the flood waters were um, up to their, over the over the banks and flooding the forest properly, well, that's, that's, they're the times we need. We need the real water. We want it now, we need it. And every time we see Outtrick out in the sky, what's in the north sky, you'll see that this is the time for the water to come. So we're looking for that water in, in springtime when the snow melts. We want that water in the forest. And that's our timeline. That's our seasonal activity time. That's our calendar, our seasonal calendar. If those events don't occur, it's, it, seven years our gum trees get stressed, you know, and it's, they're stressed now. We need to have this flow of water. We've got to do the buyback campaign, rally for that. We've got to find ways to get the water over the banks, water over the banks we want in a natural sense. We want the cultural flow. We need to find water through a cultural sense, through levels of government, if it's federal or for the Murray-Darling Basin Commission. We want to know how to do that. We need it now. It's urgent and I am living at the Koorong end of the, end of the Murray River. I live at the end of the Murray River, actually, where I live on the southeast uh, section. I'm at the South Lagoon. We've got drama here. We've got no water in the Koorong. We're working pretty closely with the uh, uh, state government here and doing a great job with the um, environment and water section. And we're working together with a, a close unity here. Where we've got a, a, a group set up that for our, for our focus group, we work with the state government and we work out ideas and concepts together at the table or on the bank. We don't do it from uh, from a, um, a different perspective, perspectives from a uh, another book somewhere that's a good idea. We we want the good ideas that are based on our cultural heritage to go with the flow. We can't be separated. We want to be a part of it. We need to be part of it now. And if we've got to hop out and find ways to get that water and achieve that, we've got to work together as a community with our various groups and all our river communities in the Murray-Darling Basin. They're working very, very, very hard for a lot of years and we're not, we're not very happy, people. Mm. Yeah, and um, so one of the other questions that came through or this is maybe combining a few different questions from people so you know fundamentally the issue here it's is a policy issue of over extraction um and you know if jamie you're saying that these projects are going to irrigate two because or, or going to water two percent of the floodplain you know what happens to that other 98 percent uh and what is how do we um, how do we address the issue of over-extraction? There are really tough choices to be made about which wetland areas to conserve uh, and which ones we can't conserve. So um, when the basin plan is fully implemented, uh, about three fifths of the historical river flows will be in the river, but two fifths would be taken out for irrigated agriculture and towns. And the amount left in the river is, appears to be diminishing with, in the Southern Basin with climate change. So we can't conserve 100% of the wetlands with three fifths of the water. Uh, and we're already losing thousands of hectares of wetland areas across the basin. And this is really tough because all of those wetland areas are important to the traditional owners and a good habitat. But um, we can't conserve them all. And we do need, I think, to have a really good consultation with the traditional owners, with local communities to work out um, what can we do with the three fifths of the water and um, what might we have to give up um, that's the tough position we're in. Now, um, the current basin plan runs up until 2026 when it is to be revised. Um, there's an opportunity for us all at that point to encourage the governments of the day to, um, to uh, take a different approach to how water is allocated. Um, in the meantime, um, 
I'd like to uh, see us get as much as we can out of the current basin plan in terms of recovering as much water uh, and in terms of things like reconnecting the floodplains to the rivers so that environmental water can be used to conserve the most wetland uh, area. Mm. Do you want to add anything? Do you want to make any comment about that, Doug? Well, where I live from the uh, Coorong's perspective, um, it's in dire straits. We're working with a pool of water at the moment. We're not working with much running water at all. Mm. Uh, we've got some lending issues at the moment. Um, we're looking at uh, seven objectives uh, to go with the Coorong, uh, um, the South End Lagoon flow, so we can get some sort of uh, salinity programming going. We've got problems with the, uh, the plant species, uh, of water plant species. We've got issues with salinity, like I mentioned before. We haven't got the flow down here. And we don't, we're only working with a bit of water. You know, it's pretty hard for us to do that. And that's um, the whole community, the state government as well, trying to encourage ways that we can look after what we've got, a little bit that we've got. We haven't got much here. And where is it? Mm. And there's a question come through from Lisa. Hi, Lisa. So she's interested to hear from Doug what it means from a traditional owner's perspective to give up. Um, you know, as, as Jamie was saying, we need to, you know, make those tough calls on which places we can save and which we can't. But from a traditional like, perspective, how, yeah, how like, do you... Like Jamie mentioned, um, it's very really hard to uh, make a decision on, on what to give up, which areas and which areas are a priority compared to others. That's very logistical and looks at... Um, We've got other areas throughout the Murray Darling Basin where we could look and work with other um, communities, Aboriginal communities, to work on what are our options. It should be given to us our right to get together as a community to work on this ethics to see what's, what is or what is the uh, priority here. And generally, that's from that uh, type of methodology, we'll be able to sort of work out a, uh, a, a better water re regime program that relates to our culture and, and it looks at ways we can uh, prevent. Uh, these things happening is, is probably the biggest matter, pre pre prevention. And uh, But it's, that's a very, very hard question and we don't know what the future is going to be hold with that one. Mm. And uh, like, for, you know, if the government was watching, like what would you need to be able to do that? Is it more time? Is it like how would they facilitate those discussions or is that something for you guys to get together with and report like and then, you know, direct back to them or how would that work? Well, unfortunately, um, it was promised with a VX study with red gum forest studies, which were involved with many years ago, is the recommendations were put up. There's several recommendations here, supporting the opinions of indigenous peoples on the, in the uh, Murray Darling Basin, as well as the, the, not, uh, the uh, river red gum forest. And uh, we're waiting for the co-management. Where is the co-management? What happened to it? Mm. Now, they've got the funding for that. We only want to know where it is. We don't know where it's gone. Where is it? Like, um, we've got uh, our people now looking and waiting to work with our, uh, our community out there to sort of uh, look after our country and care for it. How can we care for it? How can anyone go ahead and enforce uh, um, enforce uh, engineering feats uh, within the floodplain areas without proper co management? We haven't got a co management package anywhere yet. Where is it? Someone's still talking about it. There's in someone's file somewhere. Someone, what is it? What is the problem here? This is several years old now. So as soon as you start uh, working with the Aboriginal community and um, uh, supporting their opinion, let's do the let's do the co-management. Let's do the community consultation in a way where that this hasn't happened before. It's serious stuff now. We need to work together. Mm. And uh, um, so, like co-management was meant to. I think it was two thousand and nine. Was it the VIAC report um, or two thousand and ten? And, you know, should, do you think that they should stop? You know, like one of the things that I have heard is that, you know, the basin plan has all of its, you know, steps kind of laid out with its timelines and they've got to stick to that. You know, do you want to see them just pause that and address co-management first or, um, you know, because you kind of like has so many, like being engaged on so many different issues Simultaneous, simultaneously, you know, like what do you see as uh, the way forward on that? Isn't this the story with Aboriginal people's plight all along, all the time? Is that 
when something goes wrong, we become involved at the very tail end of a problem. We didn't create this problem. It's an issue that agencies throughout various states and government agencies do all the time. Some great ideas out there, but somehow they're not working. If they consult with Aboriginal people generally first, and I think ASAP, they should be getting on board. We've got Mildred out there who are doing a, a job that's internally to investigate the issue of Aboriginal cultural uh, values within, within the uh, Murray Darling Basin. And there's a start there. We need to have more people on board working with uh, various uh, uh, groups, but uh, Water Mob or as such, um, to be part of the um, administration of the care, not just positions that sort of uh, work on country. We need those, plus we had administration to be the enforcement of working together with proper management ways and ideals. Mm. And I mean, we also talked about how, you know, like choosing between which areas. Uh, the, one of the other things I hear is that these projects are a commitment to some of the very special areas. You know, Jamie, what do you say to that? You know, like when your research says that we're really only saving like a couple of percent of areas. Um, but, you know, we do need to um, sit down and assess how much water there is in a changing climate and in the society as it is right now. You know, how do you reconcile those things? There's no overview to make well-informed decisions. Each state government has taken a different approach to um, recording where the wetlands are and what condition they're in. Uh, so we talked about the in Victorian Environment Assessment Council report in Victoria in 2009. It's been a different process across the river in New South Wales. Um, the governments haven't used common measures to record what the different ecosystems are uh, to investigate things like how physically they can get water to some of these wetlands, uh, to work out which ones are most important for conserving threatened fish species or for water bird breeding, uh, and to come up with a sort of a logical way of prioritising that. What the governments did do in making the basin plan is that they identified um, 120 odd sites along the rivers that they called hydrologic indicator sites. Uh, and they then made a judgment about what the, the pulse flows would be that would keep the river healthy at that point. Uh, but they uh, haven't made those targets, haven't built those targets into their operating plans. And so the whole basin plans built on a series of environmental targets that are not very transparent and not actually linked to how they're releasing the environmental water. So I think our governments, with our help, could do a lot better job of working out where to put the environmental water we've got. Mm. And um, this is maybe a question for both of you. Like, what do we do when we feel like the government has given up on the most precious wetlands or when they're doing, going down the wrong path, you know, like what as the people, what, what can we do and what, um, how can we put pressure on them to mm. another path? Well, having spoken to a number of the relevant Victorian government officials, they're of a view that uh, stakeholders in regional Victoria uh, don't want the floodplains reconnected to the rivers with constraints relaxation. And so a really important thing that Victorians, particularly those living outside of Melbourne, can do is, you know, to communicate with the Minister for Water and say that you would actually like um, constraints relaxation. Um, the... Victorian government has been delegated the job of doing the environmental assessment on these nine individual projects. Uh, and so engaging in that planning and approval process and putting in, um, yeah, getting them to justify them would be another uh, good thing that you can do in the short term. Great, 
Do you want to add to that, Doug? Yeah, generally, like we've we've really got to um, nut out the uh, what we've got now, squeeze out what we can get left. There's not much water flowing on the bridge at the moment, but we've really got to do more community uh, awareness programming. Um, I look at uh, an awareness uh, with school curriculum is a very uh, important part that the young ones are our future. But uh, generally speaking, we've really got to sort of start speaking uh, the river language, the water language, to um, all the stakeholders and and work together to achieve better outcomes and what's happening now. Uh, the separation is due through because of borders and as such, Aboriginal people don't have borders like the river borders. We have uh, borders that relate to landscapes. We generally want to go and look at the landscapes and fashion the landscapes that are going to be suitable and prepare those because there is some very, uh, very endangered areas out there. I'm talking about endangered species out there. We've lost a lot of species in Australia already. Our, our, our totems are getting messed around, knocked around for too long. So there's a lot of things out there in, that we can work with to understand sort of how we can all work together to maintain a, uh, a balance of uh, water and, and the water quality to uh, keep the river high when it's needed. That's the ultimate goal is to get that water here. And I don't know how we can achieve that through uh, mechanisms at the moment because there's always fighting out of the water. If someone's greedy, like I said before, there's another species of frog out there. Who is it? What's its name? Mm. And some of the other things I'm seeing coming through on the comments is a federal ICAC to reduce irrigated agriculture, uh, buying back more water, particularly up north through open tender, not like the ones that are in the news around Barnaby Joyce just this week. Um, so we're just about out of time. Uh, there is a couple short, quick questions coming through. So, Jamie, on your analysis, has that been published? And if so, was it peer reviewed and where can we find it? So the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists has published a couple of critiques of the sustainable diversion limit adjustment mechanism projects. Uh, and if you go to the Wentworth Group website under publications, under water, you will find uh, a number of different analyses. Uh, this particular uh, critique I've prepared to present to you tonight, uh, you are the first people to ever see it. Uh, and indeed, I've got two wonderful research students beavering away on these projects at the moment. So Isabel, who I think is watching, has produced some of these statistics. And yes, the intention is to get them published and peer reviewed, but um, the wheels of academia grind very slowly, so they will not be published and peer reviewed for many months. In the meantime, those of you living in Victoria uh, need to get on with communicating your views to your government uh, about these projects that will be approved much more quickly otherwise. Great. And uh, Doug, do you have any final comments before we wrap up? Yeah, I'd just like to focus my attention more on community awareness and just find some more ways we get the message to get out there to... Uh, you know, get up in the high levels of governments to really uh, push the uh, power authority to really understand how important their water is at all over the Murray Darling Basin. To all our people out there, uh, little people that, that uh, we're very worried and very scared of what's happening, and um, we're we're looking forward to uh, having a better future than what we've got at the moment with our water. Thank you. Mm. Well, uh, thank you both very much for joining us. Um, it has been a really informative session and I hope everybody watching at home has gotten something out of it. Just some final comments coming through. Um, Izzy says that we need to remove the flood barriers like bridge crossings to allow uh, for higher floods. And I think that's a good example of what uh, constraints, removing constraints are. It's a very, um, you know, it's one of those specific examples. Uh, we've also got a comment from Brad saying that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was based on credible evidence and the best available science and that Aboriginal people were, ba were voiceless uh, since the very beginning on that. Um, and it is something that 
uh, needs to be rectified. Uh, and Brad, I know, is doing a lot of very good work on that. Um, and perhaps the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists could um, know, link in with some of the First Nations-led science that is taking place, um, taking place at the moment. Um, and for everyone that does want to stay informed and does want to get in touch uh, with, with different government departments and ministers about this, uh, it's uh, <laughs> quite unfortunate our website is down currently, um, but everyone who's on the mailing list, I can send you some links to, um, to emails that you can send. Um, and you can have, of course, uh, go direct to the source and look up Lisa Neville uh, or Melinda Pavey or um, Keith Pitt and, you know, look them up online and send them a comment with some of the uh, thoughts that have um, bubbled up out of this conversation. Uh, and I do also want to announce if you're hungry for more, if you've enjoyed this conversation and you would like more, we have one coming up next week on Wednesday. It's going to be with uh, David Paps, who's the former environmental water holder, um, and also Brendan Kennedy, who is the Taddy Taddy Muddy Muddy representative from Mildren. And we're going to be talking about environmental flows and cultural flows talking through some specific examples to understand how they are very distinct. Uh, they have very distinct roles to play uh, and different roles to play uh, and can be complementary. So yeah, if you've enjoyed this tonight, then we will post the link to that in the comments and we will also post it on Facebook. And when the website's up and running, we'll email you with all of that. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of thank yous and congratulations coming through on the comments. So thank you very much, Doug and Jamie. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your, for your time. Thank you, Megan and Jamie and the watchers. <laughs> thank you all. All right, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.